Jay, thanks for coming on the show. So uh, we just kind of started getting into the the space of peptides, which has been fascinating. For someone like me, I'm a big supplement guy. Um, and I'd say over the last maybe year, I've really started kind of diving into this whole world of peptides. Had no idea that it was so comprehensive. Really didn't understand its impact. Was hearing a lot of things about peptides. Started diving in. And when I would go online and look up articles and read, you know, uh, about different compounds, your stuff kept popping up and I would share your stuff the most and I would read your stuff the most because it's really good. I really like the way you write. Um, you seem like you really know what you're talking about. So that's why I have you on the shows. I wanted to talk about some of that stuff, but for our audience who may not know who you are, maybe give a little background and kind of what got you into the space and why you do what you do. Well, first of all, let me just say, I appreciate you guys. Uh, I'm honored, privileged, humbled to be here. Really grateful. Um, it's an honor really. Thanks. So thank, thank you. you guys for having me. Um, so my claim to fame, if there is one on the internet is I wrote, uh, the number one selling book ever, according to Amazon on, uh, hormone optimization or testosterone therapy. Right. Oh, wow. So you guys are familiar with those books. Uh, this first one was called the definitive TRT manual. And then the last one or the most recent one was the, uh, TOT Bible in 2018. Um, but I've been kind of like, I'm, just turned 52 literally on Friday. So I've kind of an old, an OG biohacker and that I've been in this space, like, you know, behind the scenes using peptides, using hormones. If you guys can believe this, I've been using peptides since 2004. Whoa. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So, Where did you find uh, them back yeah, then? Who, who yeah. So, uh, so, so long story, but uh, very interesting. Uh, there was a company called Southern Research Chemical Company, which was in, it was actually, nobody knew where it was at the time, but I found out later um, in Dallas, Texas, and they were literally selling peptides out of the back of a compound pharmacy. Okay. But it was a research chemical company. And, um, I first, uh, you know, just through like underground and you guys were all part of this too, you know, like the underground, uh, bro body bu building boards, like anabolic fitness. I yeah. mean, there's so many of them. I won't name some of them, <laughs> right. Cause they're still kind of anonymous, but, uh, you know, just through bros and stuff like that, you know, I found out about it and I started using, uh, Ipamorellin. I was like one of the first people, or at least from that company to use it. And it was just profound in it and in the effects that it gave my body from a fat loss, body composition change. Uh, also deep sleep and stuff. So through that, and then just, you know, my experience, um, you know, with my story on uh, hormones and what happened to me, I got kicked in the testicles when I was 29 years old playing basketball. And I went home and, um, you know, eight, six to eight weeks later, I started feeling horrible. And I went to a, just a general PPO, a HMO doctor, and the guy referred me to uh, an endocrinologist. And it turned out that the guy was a, a world renowned endocrinologist by the name of Dr. Raymond Scruggs. And he said, Hey man, he took my test and uh, I had the levels of a geriatric from a testosterone standpoint. He says, Hey, I can put you on therapeutic testosterone uh, and get you right as rain here. And you know, six, eight, 10 weeks, whatever, but you know, go home and talk to your wife about it. So I did. Um, and you know, she was like, you're a smart guy. Why not? So I went on therapeutic testosterone and you know, it's to, to make a very long story short, uh, eight weeks later when he wanted to take me off, I was like, I don't want to come off of this. I feel absolutely. <laughs> what year was this? How far, how far back? So I it? literally had just turned 30. Okay. okay. I did not have kids yet. So I have two daughters. Yeah. It was a long time ago. I've been on therapeutic testosterone for 22 years, but it was so transformative for me that then I became like this, you know, research advocate of it, started reading as much as I could, you know, reach, reached out to people that had written books like uh, Nelson Virgil, who wrote the first real uh, book on testosterone that people read, which was called Testosterone's a, Man, a Man's Guide. And shout out to Nelson if he still listens to this podcast, because, uh, you know, as I always say, stepping on the shoulders of giants, but he helped mentor me uh, to write my books and stuff like that. But anyway, I was a real student of, let's just call this the biohacking space. You know, I would read, I read prolifically everything I could get my hands on, you know, from Bulgarian and Russian research, um, you know, to whatever was out there, obviously the underground forums, you know, this is way before Reddit. These are, I, I always think of anabolic fitness and I think there was another one, miscellaneous fitness wage. You know, you guys remember these <laughs> I remember sites? Reading yeah. Those, yeah. Yeah. So there was, you know, as much information as I could get, but then I really just became, like I said, the ultimate biohacker. And then I was very meticulous and I tabulated like how I would do it. I, I used every form at the time of uh, therapeutic testosterone from transdermal to obviously injectable to subcutaneous uh, shot. And now all the way up until today, like I don't even use uh, injectable anymore. I use uh, transcrotal. So I put the cream on the base of my scrotum, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like I've used every, uh, you know, delivery system and I've worked with a lot of different doctors. Um, and thankfully I've been blessed to meet amazing people such as your guys, such as you guys. 
um, you know, who are, who've also connected me to other thought leaders and stuff in, in this space. So, you know, between the hormones and then, you know, using peptides, like I said, which I really started to get into heavily in the late 2000s, uh, up until this day, you know, I've been able to, you know, just hobnob with, you know, Dr. Seeds and, you know, other amazing people that are in that space. And so, you know, I was obviously able to write this book that just was published about a month, actually about five weeks ago now, um, which is Optimize Your Health with Therapy Peptides. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, like I said, I really like your con your, your content. It's uh, it's quite balanced. So I'm learning a lot from reading some of the stuff you've, you've written. So peptides we learned, because we had Dr. Seeds on the show not that long ago. And I asked him, what's the difference between peptides and drugs? And he said, well, peptides are based off of signaling chemicals and compounds that your body already has, Correct. which is very different than, than drugs. So yes. that was really, that kind of blew me away, right? Because I thought, well, why, why do we keep referring them to them as peptides if they have drug-like actions in the right. body? So that's a big difference. And, and, and the way he explained it is he said that because these signaling molecules already exist in the body, your body knows what to do with them. Exactly. It doesn't have these, you know, down-regulating effects. It doesn't have these downstream effects that we don't quite understand. We kind of understand because your body already uses these things. Right. So it's a very different um, category of, of medicine. It seems to be blowing up a lot now. seems to be like, so, so when you first started using them versus now, how big of a difference do you see in just, you know, questions and people using them? And does it look like it's the next frontier for medicine? It's an awesome question. So let's talk a little bit about the science without blowing anybody away. So everything that Dr. Sears said is true. So the difference between peptides and drugs or synthetic, you know, um, agents that, you know, big pharma produces is that peptides literally address the fundamental root cause, right? So they are fundamentally addressing the regenerative effect that that peptide can produce in the body. As I was telling you guys off before we went live, you know, there's now also coming out of Russia, the bioregulators, people are finding out about what bioregulators are and they're actually tissue specific and they're oral. So you can actually take an oral bioregulator that's designed to work on the prostate and it somehow, and we don't even actually know, like the, uh, there's a great Russian researcher, uh, Dr. Kavinson, um, that's written the book on uh, bioregulators. And by the way, the Russians have patented heavily bioregulators coming into the States, but they're actually available. We, we can talk at some point in the show about them and how to get them if you want. But somehow they avo avoid a uh, first pass, you know, in the liver and also in the digestive system. And they, they specifically target the tissue that the bioregulators design. So they have them for the heart, they have them for the kidneys, they have them for the intestines, they have them for the testes, again, the prostate. I mean, it's unreal how amazing these things are. But, you know, with peptides, back to your original question, um, they are addressing the fundamental root cause. So you can use a peptide to actually target an illness, a disease, an injury, you know, some sort of specificity, and it can heal it versus, again, uh, big pharma, which is, you know, obviously making for the most part drugs that treat symptoms, you mm -hmm. know, and are never really ultimately addressing the fundamental root cause. Yeah. All right, everybody. Today's giveaway is the RGB bundle. This includes MAPS Anabolic Mass Performance and MAPS Aesthetic. Here's how you can have a chance to win that bundle. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it here on YouTube. Uh, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section that you got free access to the RGB bundle. We're also running a sale right now on some workout programs. We put a bunch of them together in a bundle. It's called the Time Crunch Bundle. What's included is Maps 15 Minutes, Maps Anywhere, Maps Prime, and the ebook Eat for Performance. So that's all together, and it's discounted over $200 off. Uh, that means you only pay $99.99. If you want to learn more or you're just wanting to sign up, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Russia came up. Why are they so? Uh, why are they at the at the forefront of this kind of research? Because every time I read about them, like you know, it's been used in Russia for a long time. Study human studies in Russia, and I keep it keeps coming up. Because obviously the aliens in Russia are a little bit more advanced than the <laughs> in the United States. Uh, no, truthfully, it's funny that you guys say that because, yeah, I can go back to testosterone, the same thing. When I first started researching testosterone and I couldn't find anything, I was all, all I would be led back to was Bulgarian and Russian research, yeah. which you couldn't read Russian. You ain't getting the information, right? Yeah. Like this is obviously back in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Um, that's a good question. I mean, the, the Russians have been using peptides since the 
40s okay what? yes i didn't and, even think it was around that long well yeah. so that's the thing is like if you look at, and again it's in my book in the very beginning we can default to the book there's a little bit about history about peptides but th the united states knew about peptides in the 30s right like they were just you know again if we if we want to put our tinfoil hats on you know the rockefeller foundation which owned medicine and took over allopathic medicine you know they were like no we want to use petroleum based medical products oh. because that's how we make money. Whereas again, the peptides, there's no way to patent them because there's so many of them and they're also based on organic in our biological systems. Of course. So you can't make money, right? So it's like, oh, we're going away from those. But the Russians were looking at things differently that, you know, they were looking at like, well, how do we treat illness and disease in a way that can actually solve it, you know, versus like in the United States, we got to make money, man. The corporatocracy, mm. that's how it works yeah. here. So, I mean, very truthfully, I mean, they, they've known about them. Um, and the Russians obviously just played it out. But like I said, man, and, and I don't want to go skirt over peptides, but bioregulators. And the more I read about bioregulators, the more I'm, more I'm getting blo I'm blown away by it. Yeah. So bioregulator, explain that. What does that, yeah. mean? What does that mean exactly? So a bioregulator is basically an advanced form of, <clears throat> um, it, it, I mean, essentially it's, you know, like the peptides, which are again, are organic signaling molecules. I like to call them fractionated proteins. Um, but they're, they work in tissue specific sensitivity, right? So like when you take them and they're orally bioavailable, which is insane. Um, if you read the Cavinson protocol book again from Dr. Cavinson, who's like the, the, the premier Russian bioregulator, bioregulator expert, um, they don't really understand how they actually work in the human body. That's why I go back to the aliens card, right? Like, uh, <laughs> we don't kind of understand how these work, but they are orally bioavailable and, when you look at the research, again, there are 40 years of research with them. I mean, they do unreal things. Like, for example, all of us, like over the age of 40 guys, we should be on the prostate bioregulator, right? Because it literally goes to strengthening the prostate as we age. Because as you guys know, as we age, the, the prostate, you know, increases in size and it narrows, it constricts the uh, urethra and all the other tissues and tubules down there. So it lowers our, our urine volume, right? So like if you use this actual bioregulator prostate specific uh, medication, it will strengthen the prostate. So you won't have the BPH issues that 95% of guys do as they age, right? And then you extrapolate that with like the heart, you extrapolate that with the kidneys, you extrapolate that with like every organ system, they have bioregulators. So it's, it's pretty profound to see like what is actually out there with these things. Like my website, you guys are talking about my writing and my, um, that's like the new frontier for us from a copywriting standpoint is to really get deep into the bioregulators and start talking about them because for the first time, maybe in ever, and I want to say like it's in the last three to six months, you can now get them in the United States. They're selling them on Amazon. Wow. What? Wow. Yes. Wow. What? It's unreal stuff. And these things are very uh, profound, very, very powerful medications. Now, did so, you say it, it actually bypasses the liver, kidneys, and dude, it, it just goes it, straight? It, it has this, in, exactly. How is that it has this possible? insane, no one truly understands, but it does it is able to be uh, tissue specific and it does get through the uh, first pass in the liver. It does get through uh, the microbiome, you know, imper impermeability issues that a lot of medications have because they get destroyed in the stomach acid. Yeah. So it's not wow. like other medications that, that <clears throat> they survive passing through the liver and they actually cause elevated liver enzymes. Right. And, oh okay. no, totally. There's, uh -huh. there's, there's, there's no side effects at least understood from what we understand right now with the bioregulators. Again, they're amazing. What about peptides with that? So one so of the things that concerned me when we first were introduced to peptides, one, I didn't know they had been around that long. So I thought it was like kind of the, the front end of this. And I was like, well, what happens in 20 years? Yeah. Do we know how? So this has been around forever. Are there any side effects or adverse things that we've seen from peptides? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, to give Tim Ferriss some credit, uh, you know, he always says uh, the difference between a pill and a poison is the dosage, right? So the reality is like anything, if you take too much of something, there's always a risk reward benefit. Uh, and sometimes again, especially in our world, right. With like bros, they like to take the, the more is the better amount, effect. Yeah. Right. So yes, I mean, you can always have side effects and, you know, quote unquote symptomology from what you're taking, but for the most part, peptides are pretty well tolerated. Like, and I'll give you a good example. Like obviously right now, and you guys know this, um, and, and, and I obviously affiliate for one of them, um, the research chemical companies are everywhere, man. They're like a dime a dozen now. They pop up on the corner. You see them on Facebook advertising this and that. Like if they were truly dangerous, meaning peptides, you would have a lot of people that would have problems. 
right? So like, and again, me being in the space as long as I have, like the worst I've seen is, you know, somebody taking an entire bottle of something because again, we can talk about that, right? Like reconstituting and uh, understanding the difference between micrograms and milligrams and all this oh. stuff becomes so confusing. <laughs> oh, for that people. could be a big deal, right? Take oh, 10 I mean, micrograms, I mean, 10 you, milligrams. <laughs> you guys, you can't imagine the amount of messages I get from people that get confused about it because obviously they want to use them, but then they're like, oh, I bought all this stuff and now I have to reconstitute. What do I do? <laughs> But I mean, the side effects, I mean, again, in a worst case scenario is again, someone overdoses and then they get, you know, a, a red, you know, flushing sensation or they get like an itching or, you oh, know, wow. like a cellulitis from like injecting subcutaneously or something. But I've never really seen anybody who got truthfully sick. Now there are peptides, you know, that um, like uh, melanotan 2, uh, some of the other peptides that can cause uh, nausea. Again, if you take too much of them or if you have a, like a genetic, uh, you know, sensitivity or proclivity, you know, some people have um, polymorphisms that may, you know, show that they're predictive. Like if they inject this type of thing, they may get a reaction to it, but yeah. they're very well tolerated. Yeah. And that's just because they exist. Well they already exist. In the I, are there certain ones, like I, right away, I would think like, you know, Tessa Morlin or these ones mm -hmm. that, that bump uh, HGH, I mm -hmm. would think those would be the ones that people would try and push the boundaries with. Like how close can I get to this thing producing as much human growth hormone as yeah. possible. Is that what, is, are there common ones that people mess with like that and overdose? Yeah, or no, ha I mean, absolutely. I mean, again, the whole, you know, bro, more is better thing. I mean, we, we, we should probably spend some time talking about the growth hormone related peptides. Um, so like, again, and, 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 and for the listening audience, you know, everything is in my book. And if you don't want to pay buy my book, that's cool too. Cause as you guys know, it's all for free on the website. It's on jcampbell.com. But, uh, Tessa Morellin is a very interesting peptide. So it's, and let me take a step back just so for, again, for the listening audience. So there's probably now between eight and 14, I think FDA approved peptides. Okay. So again, well-studied, well-used. One of the biggest, most well-known that you guys probably talked about with seeds is uh, TA1, which is thymus and alpha one, Okay. which I know we're going to talk about longevity and stuff like that at, at some point in this podcast, but TA1 is literally like a sham wow peptide. Like, like that <laughs> peptide, just that sham peptide, wow yeah. so that peptide and GHKCU <laughs> are the sham wow <laughs> peptides and that they have so many uses. They're so All utilitarian. Right. You can use them in like so many different capacities, but um, it's, you know, obviously TA1 is FDA approved. So every doctor that is out there that prescribes peptides or knows anything about peptides is prescribing that for his patients or their patients. Because I mean, look, you could take TA1 uh, just before you get on an airplane because it enhances immun immunity so much, right? Like it literally within an hour will it provide an immune effect or, or stimulate immunity to oh, your body. Wow. So, you know, from a, you know, quote unquote bioweapon to, you know, airborne right. viruses and all these other things. I mean, like that's going to provide, you know, massive immunity stimulation, like right before you take it. So, but to, to say Tessa Morellin, so Tessa Morellin is also a uh, FDA approved peptide under the name Agrifta. And just so you guys know, if you're a listening audience, it was actually made for guys who are suffering from HIV, uh, who are HIV positive, who get what is known as um, uh, uh, a condition called lipodystrophy. And lipodystrophy is like really hard visceral fat in the in the center adiposity. And when you have lipodystrophy, it's that the visceral fat is so hard, it's very difficult to get rid of. Like they can't even have liposuction. So they developed this drug. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure, fact check me, it was either Merck or Lilly. And when you inject it into that lipodystrophy fat or that lipodystrophy fat, it literally like emulsifies it and just, it's like a hot knife through butter. So for bros, right, you got a belly fat and you inject it right into the belly fat. It's pretty, pretty effective in getting rid of the fat right in the midsection. So I started using Tessa Morellin myself in 2018 uh, from TaylorMade uh, Compound Pharmacy. Uh, which is at one point where all the doctors and everybody in the peptide space were getting their um, peptides from. And I was like blown away, guys. I mean, in four weeks, like, you know, I, I, I'm a pretty lean guy, but like just the little tiny bit of belly fat I had around my midsection was gone in four weeks. I mean, it was gone. So it radically gets rid of belly fat. The problem with Agrifta now is it's hard to find it. You know, there's only a couple of the research chemical companies that sell it because it is an FDA approved peptide. It's technically not able to be sold by a research chemical company. I mean, that we can talk about that if you guys want to get into that too. That's a whole weird whole thing, you know, how the FDA looks at those companies versus compound pharmacies. Um, but the next thing that's important about it is it's outrageously expensive. It's more expensive than growth hormone. 
So if you're going to like be comparing it to like a really high quality growth hormone pound for pound, you know, is it worth or is it as effective as growth hormone? I don't think it is. Mm. Uh, and I also know that it's not as it's, it's more expensive. Right. It's more accessible though, right? So that's probably the, I mean, it depends. not by someone like you who probably yeah, has yeah, those yeah. No, 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 but I mean, it, that's a good point and a good question because it really depends. I mean, like if you're connected to somebody in the HIV world, it's very accessible, but mm. it's 4,200 bucks a month oh, wow. for a script for wow. it. And it's yeah, only in the way they want you to dose. It's like one milligram at night. Like for guys like us to lose belly fat or to rip through visceral body fat, you're, the, the dosage is one milligram AM, one milligram PM. But, you know, to, to talk about the other growth hormone inducing peptides. Yeah, because there's quick. ipamerolin, there's CGHC. Yeah, so ipamerolin. Uh, Ibutamorin is yep, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so ipamerolin was the first, as I was telling you guys, that's how I got my experience in starting peptides way back in the early days of 2000. And that is a very interesting peptide because it's the only growth hormone. It's a, G8, a GNRH peptide. Uh, and again, all of this is defined in the book without going too esoteric and, and granular and, you know, boring people. Um, it is the only peptide that will not disturb uh, uh, the body's endogenous production. And it also doesn't have the ability like most peptides do to increase prolactin and cortisol, which as you guys know, cortisol, you know, you don't want more of that. And prolactin obviously causes all sorts of like glandular issues. Sometimes it can actually induce gyno in men, but um, that was the one that I was using. I actually used that with my wife, um, you know, back when we heard, I met in 2012, been together for 10 years, but like she was, um, um, a female fitness competitor at the time. And I got her on Ipamorelin and in like six months, her body, her, her, her body changed so much, like so much so that her family was like, Oh my God, this guy's got her on these drugs and <laughs> what is happening to her and stuff like that. But I actually have a, you know, we have a picture of like what she went from to what she looks like in the book. Back in 2012, when I first started using Ipamorelin, and you know that was when people were like, "What is this?" But it's a very profound peptide. Um, that's my favorite peptide for anybody looking to in use or you know introduce uh, increasing growth hormone without doing anything to their body's natural production of it. Yeah. Um, but you guys were you're right. You know, Ip uh, ibutamorin, which is called you know in the in the research chemical space MK677. Uh, don't like that one, even though it does have nice effects in increasing growth hormone because it does increase prolactin, it does increase cortisol, and it has this disturbing side effect of increasing appetite. Big time. So yeah. that's so. So I this. <laughs> so this one, had to get off. Of yeah. <laughs> no, no. So this one I've used so, every so five so minutes. Dude. Okay. So, so, so like, like, it's, no. it's a, well, it's a ghrelin. It's a ghrelin mimic, right? Yeah, exactly. And ghrelin takes exactly. exactly. So right. here's what I noticed with the growth hormone releasing because I've now I've tried uh, the CJC. Yeah. I think what was it twelve nine five. Yep. I, with an ipamorelin combo. I did yep. the tessamorelin, ipamorelin combo, and then I've done the ibutamorin. The the other ones seem to give me kind of a leaning out effect, kind of a rejuvenating effect. Sure, sure. Uh, ibutamorin is like a mass builder. Part of it's because it makes me eat a lot. But Did it get, make you wake up in the middle of the night? No, not that it bad. It does that to but some people. Not uh, that bad, but I'll literally- I actually felt like I slept hard on it. That's I do it, sleep hard I, on it. That's what I felt. But it, it. I get crazy pumps in the gym. Yeah. Like I, I get a bulker. Yeah. So people who take growth hormone releasing peptides typically want to get lean. Right, exactly. Ibutamorin- I don't, there's no way I could diet on a butamorin. There's no way it's, it's like a, it's a bulker for it's, me. It's a hundred percent. So I've only used it twice. And when I was using it, and by the way, that's also been around a long time. The research okay. chemical companies have been selling that one since like 2009, 2010. It was like right after Ipamorelin, but I've used the compound pharmacies and we could talk about research chemical quality versus compound and stuff like that. If you guys want to, uh, there's not much of a difference, even though, you know, the hype is very real and that there is, um, when I used it, I, it, it, same thing. Like I, I literally, I have a pretty crazy appetite as it is. And I was like, I can't, this is insane. But I would literally wake up in the middle of the night <laughs> and be like, I got to eat. Something. I mean, I was raiding my refrigerator. But the other problem about that medication, and again, this is like very understood in the clinical literature, is that it, it eventually stops working. All right. Like it's, yeah. so, so let's talk about that. So, mm -hmm. so this is what, why peptides need to be cycled is that, um, the body, again, being a very uh, effective homeostatic mechanism or regulating, you know, uh, group of uh, um, biological systems eventually just gets to a point with when it's using peptides where it's like, okay, this isn't going to work anymore. And we build up antibodies to that. Oh, okay. And then when the once the antibodies are built up, and again, this is really going to come down to all of us as end users because we're all biochemically unique, as you guys know, and different. We're all N of one. Um, you have to know when it's not working anymore. 
Mm -hmm. And so you have a lot of bros that aren't, you know, really truly intuitive and in tune to them. And they're like using these things for like 14, 16, 18 weeks. And it's like, it stopped work or stop working at like six weeks or seven weeks or eight weeks. So you really have to know when you're using peptides, like, am I still seeing an effect? And so I just tell people like when I consult with them or work with them and stuff like that is like, look, man, just to make it clear and safe. And again, there's no templatized cookie cutter approaches. Don't use peptides for longer than eight weeks. Because the likelihood that you have antibody buildup and formation at that point is pretty high. And so you're just not going to see the same results. So you should, you know, six to eight weeks and then take the same amount of time off if you're going to do them, do them again. Right? Interesting. I haven't heard anyone say that yet. Yeah, yeah so, no. Oh, and, no. So well, then, well I'll, let, me, let me blow your mind even further. And again, nobody talks about this. And this is why people love me when I, when I do this because I go after doctors. You also have to realize, like, if you're at a certain age, right, and you don't have any natural IGF-1 production left, how is a peptide even going to work, right? Because how do they work? They're stimulating your natural IGF-1 production. Again, the growth hormone releasers, right? So, like, if you're 55 years old and you don't have any idea what your IGF-1 levels are, first get tested, right? They're very cheap. You can get a test anywhere for 30 to 40 bucks. Uh, and then look, know what you're working with. If you don't have any, you know, you can't use ipamorelin or tesamorelin like somebody who's 40 years old that has high IGF-1 levels. You know what I'm saying? Because like, it's not going to work anyway. So that's when I tell people, like, you really have to understand, like, when does growth hormone come into the play versus peptides? And, you know, I'm happy to go deep on growth hormone because I've written a very, you know, 10,000 word article on growth hormone. I know all the research I've looked into it. I personally use growth hormone now and I use a very surgically precise low dose and I'm t I take off the weekends. So I use genotropin in a 36 IU pen Monday through Friday, one IU. And that's I've it, obviously, yeah, just one IU. That's it. And, and look, Here's the problem with growth hormone, and this is where all the research is indicative of this, and this is where people get lost. And again, doctors will dispute me, probably seeds, I know, you know, him and I will go back and forth on this, but all the research in growth hormone is in comorbid people, okay? So older, elderly, sick people, and in children that have dwarfism, right? right? They don't and produce And they're growth taking, hormone. exactly, and they're taking massive amounts of growth hormone, and they don't have the side effects. Now, the side effects that they do have are acromology, right? Which is the in, in size, increase in size of bones. But for the kids that are dwarfs, you know, for them, they'll take like enlarged, you know, uh, bone structures or whatever to be taller. And by the way, growth hormone normally works in like 80% of those people, right? So they end up becoming quote unquote normal size, right? But when you look at people like us, right? Aging men and women who are literally looking to live longer and stronger, there is no research anywhere that doesn't show positive benefits of using growth hormone. The problem is, and again, it's the more is better deal, is that we see bodybuilders and we see performance enhanced yeah. people taking 10 and 15 and 20 IUs of this stuff a day. And yeah. then they're combining it with insulin. They're combining it with anabolic agents, testosterone, blah, 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 all these other things. That's when you see side effect profile. That's when you see injury. That's when you see potential disease states. You know, you hear these people screaming about how growth hormone can exacerbate metastatic tumor formation and it can, you know, increase the risk that you get cancer. Maybe, right? But that's also if you're not using it in a surgically precise dose. So I'm all about using peptides. I'm all about using growth hormone. But again, it's always about the dosage. What dosage makes sense? Who are you as far as your age? You know, are you really truly looking at your IGF-1 levels? Do you understand like whether a peptide is going to work versus growth hormone? And I'll tell people this, and this is very true. The average 60-year-old person who doesn't have high IGF-1 levels or any IGF-1 levels is not going to get the same effect using peptides that they would use growth hormone. Now, what's interesting is that taking uh, HGH is the opposite then of what the peptides, because that is something that you want to take for an extended period of time to get the benefits of it, right? So Correct. You, if you were taking something like tesamorelin, exactly right. you're saying you run that for like eight weeks, cycle off of it. You're taking something like HGH, that's something that you- You just always take. You, exactly. And it, it, you're a smart guy. You, 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 you want to you wanna make sure though. And again, you know, for me, discretion is always a better part of valor. Uh, you, you definitely want to make sure that you're giving your body some time off, right? So, I mean, at the end of the day, you're going to hear doctors say, oh, if you get on growth hormone, you're going to become dependent on it. I've tested myself since I started using growth hormone, which was two years ago, by the way, um, uh, IGF, you know, every other marker and on or off, it's the same. So I am not disturbing yeah. my body's natural production by taking one IU That's a low and dose. taking Saturday and Sunday off. But here's the thing. 
And this is also where people get confused. And I'm sure you're going to have people when they hear this podcast, you know, in the comment section saying stuff, the bros are going to say this. And I love the bros. I love shout outs to all my bodybuilder buddies. Okay. <laughs> the difference we'll between using pump. genotropin, which is Pfizer growth hormone or nortotropin, which is Nordic's growth hormone and bro growth hormone, like Chinese growth hormone, <laughs> you guys, it's literally like, it's not even apples and oranges. I mean, it's not mm. even Mars and Venus. I mean, it, the differentiation is so strong just it's just gigantic it's a gulf yeah. right you don't mm. even know what you're getting when you're using generic growth hormone coming from china i've experienced we don't that. have to get into 191 and 192 you know amino acid sequencing and all that stuff but at the end of the day if you're using a pharmaceutical grade growth hormone in a very surgically precise dose and you're doing it right and by the way doing it right is taking it in the morning Doing it wrong is taking it at night. Because then you'll disturb your own production, Yes, right? okay. and you disturb your circadian mm. rhythm. That's why all the bros, they take it at night because they're so geared out on everything else. It does allow them to sleep better, but then what else happens to happen? They got to take naps during the day, right? Mm -hmm. Constantly, I got to take a nap, bro. Yeah. Because they're disturbing it's their circadian I'm growing. rhythm. <laughs> but that's true too. But they are disturbing baby. their circadian rhythm. But if you're taking growth hormone, again, for life extension purposes, to live longer, stronger, leaner, all the things you guys talked about, better sleep, better skin quality. By the way, it also enhances libido, right? There's a well-being effect. It does mm -hmm. dopamine signaling. So if you're taking this low dosage of it, I, and again, this is just the Jay Campbell personal opinion, take the weekends off. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people... Again, a lot of clinicians who do understand growth hormone and there aren't enough of them will say, oh, you don't need to do that. That, you know, at a certain age, you don't have any natural production of IGF-1 levels. So just do it seven days a week. Just take a surgically precise dose. Again, I like the discretion is a better form of valor. Take time off, right? Yeah. Just allow your body to have two night, two days a week off of it. So I just use Monday through Friday in the morning. Yeah. That's Interesting. It. You were talking about taking one IU. I read an article about Ibutamorin in particular where they were showing blood work. And they were saying it was equivalent to three to four IUs of growth. It hormone. probably is. And that's, that's probably crazy. the reason. Yeah. Well, that's, and that's also the reason why that shit sucks because it's Too causing, much. yeah, it's causing ibutamorin of all the peptides, like in the research in the clinical research, it shows the greatest variational release of prolactin and cortisol. Mm. So it's whacking you. So, yeah. So, so when, I so, mean, you feel it. I mean, I'll, oh, absolutely. Yeah, but yeah. so when is ibutamorin good? It's great for hard gainers. It's okay. definitely good for skinny, you know, really thin guys That's that just cannot like put on weight. <laughs> yeah. Dude, just yeah, not you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know what I'm saying? But like, no, but I mean, like yeah. little, you, you guys know, you know, you, you guys know this because you guys are in training game for a long time. Like when people say I'm a hard gainer, A, they they, they can't eat a lot, right? Yeah. Um, and it's usually because they have digestive tract issues, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. like people like that, it's great for because they will be hungrier. They will be able to eat more and be able to train at a higher yeah. intensity with more food. But other than that, I would never use it because of the exact same thing. So yeah. It's just causing spikes. Yeah, that's what. So what I noticed is a high appetite. I got water retention, but crazy oh, the water pumps. retention is insane. But crazy pumps. You know what you're reminding me of. So um, my experience using you know things that were quote unquote. I mean, I guess black market, gray market. Early 2000s. This was the designer steroid era, right? It's when they were of all course, over the counter. The clear. Yeah, like you know, super draw, methyl super one. Draw. Yeah, remember that shit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. methyl one one test. And your, all. your liver would fall out after a week. <laughs> yeah, well, I had. You know, I was a kid. I was. I was just at the supplement store. I'm like, this work. Just take it. It's the um, irony of that, you would have been better off taking real steroids. I would have been better off then, buying yeah. D ball Dude. on the black market yeah. or something like that. But, but yeah, I was because it was over the counter. So that's what I bought. Um, it reminds me of stuff like that. Like I yeah. take it and I feel it. So, but I'm like, this is not to get lean. There's no way I could get lean on this because I just get too hungry. I'm interested in, um, cause you said you were using a blend of IPA and Tessa. So for everybody listening, IPA and Tessa is by far the, you know, that's the Rolls Royce platinum deluxe package of getting strong and building muscle with peptides. Okay. Those two peptides massively increase um, uh, intercellular water retention, which, as you know, is going to allow you to stretch your muscles, get better pump, yep. be mm -hmm. stronger, have much better glycogen. It also enhances uh, the enzyme. Um, IPA and Tessa together, there's research that shows it increases uh, gly glycogen synthase or whatever that enzyme is that allows for better glycogen oh, okay. restoration. So oh, I did it one time in my life. And you guys, I, it's the same thing as you. I was so strong, but mm -hmm. I literally was like looking down at my stomach and I'm like holding like two inches of water in my belly button. Yeah. And I'm like, ah, you know, I don't like yeah, this. It's interesting. It is interesting. All right. So I want to move into longevity peptides. Sure. This is where I'm really getting fascinated because I just turned 44 
And I just started using a peptide that you could loosely um, place. So we're working with a company and they, and I told them, I'm like, make me your guinea pig. Send me what you think I would be cool to try because then I could talk about it on the show. So they sent me something called Mott C. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I guess you could loosely put it in the longevity category, although um, other people would put it in like the fat loss category or whatever. I say loosely because it, the what I've read on it so far is they found that people who live a long time have more Mott C in their system than people who don't. Well, anyway, I just started it and um, it has to be my favorite peptide so far. Like awesome. lots of energy. I feel very clear um, headed. My workout performance seems pretty uh, surreal in, in terms of stamina. Um, so let's go with the longevity. Start with Motsi just for selfishly. I'm fascinated by it and what the hell it's doing in my body. I've read some of your stuff, but I'd sure. love to talk to you about well, it. Well, let's, uh, let me ask you first, like what is your dosing protocol with it? Um, 10 milligrams. Uh, it was, it started, uh, three days a week and then once a week afterwards. Okay. So you're getting like a 10 milligram vial and injecting the, 10, the whole yeah, thing. That's right. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's a big um, dose. Yeah, no, I mean, I, well, I mean, look, I mean, I mean, look, well, so it's interesting and it's perfect. No, no, no. It's a, it's a perfect way to talk about this because I think the biggest confusion principle for people that do peptides is how much bacterial static water do I put in the vial if the right. vial isn't coming with bacterial static water? And we can even talk about that, right? Because the difference between research chemical companies and compounding pharmacies is a compounding pharmacy is licensed to sell you a drug that you can use right away. Right. Versus a research chemical uh, company there's isn't. There's a couple steps, right? I see. Exactly. Yeah. And the research chemical company is like indemnifying themselves that you're using it on your laboratory animal and that this is mm. not for human <laughs> use, right? Mm -hmm. But we all know that, I mean, look, let's be honest. We all know that people are using them on themselves. Uh, they are their own laboratory animal. And the differentiation is that the research chemical company is not quote unquote, making their products in a sterile, you know, uh, compound pharmacy, uh, you know, stringent uh, quality control and stuff like that. that. Yeah. Right. But, but the truth is, is, that, you know, I know the businesses very well, obviously. And a lot of the research chemical companies are using very similar, uh, quality control that the compound pharmacies are. Okay. And then you got to even go deeper, right? Like where are they getting their raw materials? Where are they getting their active ingredients? And the best ones are getting them from the same place. And, you know, I happen to know, you know, that whole business and, and, and industry also too. So it's like, you got to be, you know, just use, you, how do I say this? The best way to say, it? you know, be a smart consumer. Make sure that if you're buying your peptides from a research chemical company that it is, you know, gets good reviews and that you know where they're getting their stuff from. Because yeah. I'll be honest with you guys, there definitely are research chemical companies up making it, you know, th like that on top of that every night, right? Wow. In their kitchen, okay? Or their okay. basement or their bathroom, oh, wherever geez. it is. And a lot of them are completely unregulated. And, you know, you ask that question, you know, like, what are the risks? Well, I mean, in something like that, there's contamination risks. Now, again, peptides are very, very well tolerated. And you have never seen anybody, at least that I know of, who's died from a peptide injection. That's not to say it couldn't happen, but just be very cautious on that. Okay. But to, to back to MOTC, and that was a nice little rabbit hole. Um, MOTC is an amazing uh, mitochondrial stimulator. Okay. So like if we, you know, do a quick deep dive on like, what are the mitochondria? You guys all know from 10th grade biology, they're the uh, powerhouses of the cells, right? Like the mitochondria of the cells are what, you know, in enhances or increases energy. So MOTC stimulates the mitochondrial to optimize, okay, in the cells. So the less optimized a person is mitochondrially, the more effect technically or theoretically MOTC will work. Now, the fact that you told me you're now the second person Ben Polkolsky being the other one. And we all know Ben is a monster. I mean, he isn't anymore, but he's still, man, I mean, he's yeah. got more yeah. muscle than most of us. He's buyer, still right? a monster. Yeah, he's but still I mean, like, I, he's trying trying to I mean, honestly, I just had a Zoom call with him two days ago and I'm looking at him like, Ben, you're starting to look like me, bro. Like, <laughs> No, but I mean, like, you know how it is. I mean, like, yeah, a, right. when you're not a pro bodybuilder anymore, you're not going to look like yeah. a mutant anymore, yeah, right? Yeah, but, like, yeah. I love Ben, man. Ben's the most amazing human on the planet. But uh, th the truth is, is that... Um, he got good results from it as well, right? He, amazing. Yeah. And so both of you guys are telling me that. So, like, because I was under the assumption, and this is just more learning even for me, um, which is obviously a never ending process of life of learning, right? What is it like? The more, the more you learn, the less, you know, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. but, but, but the truth is, is like, um, I used to think based on my experience and what I would see with people that the less conditioned a person were, was the better the results from MOTC, which makes sense because again, they don't have their mitochondrial right, optimized. Right. So the heavier, more obese, more inflamed, more insulin resistant one is the less they have mitochondrial stimulation. Right. So all of a sudden you inject MOTC in and it's like an accelerant and they're right. like, Whoa. And I've seen heavy people go on that and they're like, 
this is the most amazing. You know, they like change. They're like, oh my God, I feel like you now, man. Like I want to work out twice a day. So that's weird. So, I mean, again, I, I, I think it's another interesting pattern that we're not, we're so all biochemically unique. Um, because as I told you guys, like when I use Mott C, I don't get that effect wow. at all. Like I don't feel anything. I mean, actually the only thing that I felt the very, very first time, and by the way, I did the same thing you did. I did, I didn't do it all at once. So I took five and five, Okay. but it was in the same day. I, I was laying there staring at the ceiling. Yeah. I was in bed, like what's going on, yeah, but yeah. I did not feel like better energy to train and stuff like that. So again, we're all unique, but again, in the research, it's an amazing peptide. I mean, for heavy people, this is a peptide that will change the game. Like, absolutely, if you are obese or you are heavy and you're listening to this podcast and you need to lose weight, this is a peptide that must be in your protocol Jay, without question. Jay, can you explain to me uh, how that is different than, say, something like um, uh, infrared light? So, like, how do those sure. how do those differentiate? And is there would there be value in taking mod C with yeah. the the infrared? A hundred percent, there would be value again, depending on the person. So, I mean, the infrared stimulation is just not as profound as the mod C, right? Because the mod C is being injected right into the cell. So you're literally hitting the cells or hitting the mitochondria is like at the place that their origin versus the red light is more of an external weaker stimuli. But in combination, they're amazing. Without question. I mean, like, I actually, it just made me think of something because, like, and we can talk about this too. Like, I'm, I'm really big into that, uh, into hair loss and hair regrowth, you know, and there's profound stuff coming. Like, I actually work with a company that's making a hair regrowth product right now that's topical that will literally be the most amazing thing in the history really? of the world. It's going to regrow people's hair. Like, like tra transplants are probably about five years going to be gone. That's wow. how profound some of these peptide cool. regrowth products are. Get your hair back, Adam. Oh. Yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, me too, man. Yeah, you, know, you have follicles, so you can absolutely regrow. I always tell people, like, if you don't have active follicles on your scalp, then no peptide's going to work. Right. But if you have active follicles, then it'll regrow. And very important, too, for the listening audience, and, you know, we wrote this article, like, I can't believe it's almost three years ago now, and the New York Times picked it up, but we now know what causes hair loss, right? What do you guys think? What, what causes? Well, what I've always read was it was what just you think it DHT is? receptors, nope. right? So nope. androgenic mm -hmm. alopecia. Nope. Okay. Nope. What do you tell, think tell me then. That's what that's I it. want you guys to guess because no, I, it, it's an I interesting mean, just thing. genetic factors Thanks. for the most yeah. part, right? There's part of that. That's part of it. So all those things play a role, but the primary reason that we lose hair is due to blood flow restriction to the scalp. Oh, wow. really? So we now know that hmm. even if you guys, you guys are all right, partially. So I should hang upside down every night. That would help me. <laughs> I, 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 I literally would, but but here's the here's the, here's the thing. Here's the thing. So, yes, there is a predisposition to balding, which is what you said, androgenic alopecia. Yes, people have uh, you know uh, a genetic predisposition to thinning, but if we control for blood flow restriction, which peptides can do, red light can do. Uh, you know, these new bioregulators are probably going to be able to do, then we can actually slow down, even if we're genetically predisposed to lose our hair completely, right? So these topical peptide formulations with very powerful angiogenic uh, cofactors like GHKCU, copper peptide, which we'll talk about as we go deeper, um, can absolutely regrow hair to the scalp. It's actually pretty profound. Like I said, I'm kind of a geek into that research right huh. now, but what's coming and it's not long is products that will regrow your hair completely. Wow. Okay. That's huge. But DHT inhibition, just so we can talk about that for one second. Yeah, because right now people will take things like finasteride, dutasteride. So this is, again, I'm going to blow minds here and, and I'm going to get, you know, pushback from people. But DHT inhibition, the only thing that DHT inhibition actually does from a hair loss stoppage standpoint is it attaches to the receptors in the scalp, which prevents further deminiaturization. So as you guys know, and you guys have heard this from any person who's ever used uh, DHT inhibitor, whether it was medical, which is finasteride, proscar, um, or you know, over-the-counter minoxidil, as soon as you stop, your hair falls out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because now it's not attached to the receptor. And it's toxin to the actual follicular receptors in the scalp, right? So we've done research and again, written articles. And again, this is scary stuff, but like, Guys who are on long-term DHT inhibitors, those are cell toxins. 
So you are shortening your lifespan using mm. DHT inhibitors. Now, nobody mm. wants to talk about this because again, there's no real tests to really prove it other than I'm sure you guys are familiar now with the biological age tests. Mm -hmm. So if you go to like a true diagnostic or a glycan age, or I know there's a couple other ones out there now and you get those tests done, you can actually look at your telomere factors. And we're going to get in deeper as we go down further into this with um, um, telomerase expression extension, which is what thymolin and epithelon do. Um, you know that you're shortening your lifespan by using a DHT inhibitor because it literally is shortening the telomerase factor. Wow. They show mm -hmm. that, huh? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Wow, but, but well they do, but nobody's looking for it. So like if somebody says to me, Jay Campbell can't prove that. Uh, I can, I just got to go to those tests and I got to pull them out and I got to start looking at those transcription factors. But the smart guys that run those companies, the Ryan Smith of the world, he can say, yes, you're right. But it hasn't really got out into the forefront. Now, the other thing is, as you guys know, this is there are plenty of people who use DHD inhibitors like finasteride and have no side effects mm -hmm. versus other guys who take it for one week and are sexually dysfunctional forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. You wow. Have, really? You have, dude, post finasteride syndrome, PFS. I've had two friends in my life who've killed themselves from PFS. Oh, that's terrible. Wow. No, it's wow. horrible, but it's very well known, you know, in the clinical literature that some people who take DHT inhibitors literally have dis permanent sexual dysfunction. Is that because it just kills those receptors and that's it? Now the DHT can never... Probably. Nobody really knows the answer. I mean, like all the research on it, nobody knows. It's just one of those drugs. And again, I think because mm. it's a cell toxin, um, that the DHT inhibitor just does a lot of negative things downstream in the human body, right? Mm -hmm. Like they give DHT inhibitors to women too. Do you guys know that? I didn't yeah. know that. I just found this out in the last couple of years. Yeah, women take DHT Same inhibitors thing. to stop oh. hair loss. Yeah. It's oh. just, it's yeah. a horrible thing. If you're listening to this and you're using these things, don't cold turkey them, especially if you've been on, cause I get this question a lot. If you've been on them for a long time, cause again, all your hair will fall out, uh, we can, we can, t I, I can give you guys some options or whatever, but, you know, make sure you start using an angiogenic effector, uh, you know, topical solution. There's many now coming into the market. Uh, Ian Mitchell has one now, okay. you know, my company, which we sold last year, Sear Custom, we have a product called Oxano Grow, it's completely out of stock. But um, the one that I told you guys about that if we want to talk about, we can, it's coming is going to be like the, the, the bee's knees when it comes to regrowth. But you want to make sure that you put on an angiogenic, um, you know, enhancer first before you kill a DHT inhibitor so that it does prevent, it increases the health of the scalp and the follicle so that when you stop the DHT inhibitor, you when it demineralizes, it doesn't fall out. Now, isn't this, now, salt palmetto, that's an herb that has been somewhat shown yep. to reduce DHT, but that's different, right? That has a different mechanism. It's totally, but so here's the thing is like, as I always say it like this to get a little spiritual, like we never want to block anything that God created, right? Like anything that's like a, like a, like a DHT inhibitor system, just like you guys know with AIs, right? You never want to use an aromatase inhibitor because when you block estrogen, you're creating downstream issues, right? So it's like, we now know that like with using therapeutic testosterone, you never ever inhibit testosterone. I mean, uh, estradiol production, which creates estrogen because you want the estrogen to fall to your genetic level, right? So like when a guy goes on therapeutic testosterone, you never ever inhibit the estrogen because the estrogen is what confers the protection to the biological systems, bone mineral, brain health, cardiovascular health, that's what estrogen does, right? So it's like, I always tell people like, if you're gonna use therapeutic testosterone, you have to allow your estrogen to go wherever it's gonna go. There's no such thing either, by the way, as high estrogen symptoms. People that think high estrogen symptoms, which are quantified as high estrogen symptoms are actually inflammatory responses to too high a body fat and insulin resistance. So when you hear a doctor say, oh, I gave this guy an AI to inhibit his estrogen because he has high E2 symptoms, he doesn't have high estrogen symptoms. He has high symptoms due to inflammation. Interesting. Well, I know low estrogen in men can can feel like low testosterone. Exactly. Even. Well, that's what happens when you give a guy an AI when they're on therapeutic testosterone. You push their estrogen signal so low that you cause all sorts of horrible downstream effects, which destroys bone mineral density. I mean, I, I know I just rabbit hole by bringing that up, but it's yeah. very similar. DHT inhib inhibition and aromatase inhibition are wrong because you allow those pathways to just be naturally expressed. So it's like even in testosterone, uh, I mean, in hair, you don't ever want to inhibit DHT because DHT isn't really the ultimate causation or causal agent of hair loss. I see. It's like putting a Band-Aid on it. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Right, Another big pharma uh, 
play. Exactly. All right. Mm. So let's get let's get back into longevity. So yeah. we talked about Motsi. You mentioned a couple others. Uh, For sure. I can't remember the, the ones you named? Epitalon, Epitalon, and Thymolin. Yeah. So let's talk about let's talk about one of those. Uh, let, let's talk about the first one, Epitalon. How does sure. that work um, in the body? What are the results like? You know, what is it? Yeah. So Epitalon is a profound peptide uh, that. So I'll just put it, give it this way right now. As soon as you turn 45, and, and depending on, again, you know, how much you're taking care of yourself, you could probably even move down to 40. You should be doing two, at a minimum one, but two cycles of Epitalon and Thymol in a year. So what they do is, so uh, Epitalon actually works on the uh, telomerase express uh, uh, pathway. So telomerase is, is essentially the enzyme that allows uh, your telomeres to lengthen or to shorten, right? So as we age, the shorter our telomeres get, the less productive they are and actually enhancing telomerase production, the faster we age. So uh, epitalon actually goes to work by enhancing that enzyme of telomerase and improving it. So as we age, we don't have, um, our, our, our telomeres are not shortening. Mm -hmm. They're actually lengthening and they're staying active and they're staying mobile and agile and everything else. So your biological age can actually exactly. lower. Exactly. So essentially, like if we wanted to get into alchemy and we went really weird right now and stuff like that, like the, the philosopher stone had a way to literally extend or keep telomerase like you were 15 years old forever. So like these, these alchemists that figured out how to create the, the philosopher's stone were, were able to actually turn off telomerase expression so that it just kept you at like a 15 year old late. So you live for, you know, a thousand years, you know, the Methuselah gene. Okay. Okay. Interesting. What does it feel like when you take it then? Uh, you feel nothing. So essentially, <laughs> no, I mean, you don't. So, I mean, like, that's the thing is like, you know, it's a good question because a lot of people like they want to feel something, they yeah. want to experience something, but you don't feel anything. It's just a, you know, subcutaneous injection. Now, thymolin you want to take at the same time. And by the way, you can take these both in isolation, but we've found now that you want to use them together because they both do very synergistic things. But thymolin enhances the thyma, the thymus gland and the thymus gland is the, the uh, immuno dodge, immunomodulator uh, effect of the body, right? So the stronger your thymus gland, the more immune you are okay. as you age. Now, what's interesting about that one is I heard from somebody in the space that during the whole COVID pandemic, that they were trying to kind of crack down on thymolin and related peptides, of course, because they because people were finding it, <laughs> people were finding it to be I so wonder effective. Why. Yeah, so so it's still available. Uh, oh, because, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, but well, okay. So that's a good question, and we uh, we have to get into this. So, oh man, uh, hopefully you don't get your sponsors in trouble here. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> that's all good. Uh, the, the the truth is is this: the FDA does not want peptides to become mainstream, right? Because if it did. What happens to big pharma? Right. It replaces a ton of drugs. Exactly. That's as simple as you could possibly say it. Right. I don't have to go any deeper conspiratorial or anything. <laughs> I don't have to put my tinfoil hat on. That's 100% true. It eliminates a gigantic trillion dollar profit center. Because mm. again, remember what we talked about in the beginning, peptides and bioregulators address the fundamental root cause. Remember what Chris Rock said, the money is not in healing, it's in the medicine, mm -hmm. right? So they're not going to allow healing to occur. So the, like the good news is, is like your listening audience, all of us, people like us, we can use peptides and bioregulators to heal. We don't even have to go to modern medicine. I'm telling you, we probably, I'll probably come back. We'll do a whole show on bioregulators and we can talk about how like it eliminates the need to go to doctors as you age, because you're literally using something that's working the organ system that you don't need to even get tested anymore. You know, why would you want to get your colon looked at with a diagnostic tool that is like horrible and does so many bad things to the body when you can actually use a bioregulator to strengthen your colon as you get older, right? Same thing with your testes, same thing with your prostate. Mm -hmm. So all these male health things, same thing with women's health. Interesting. Wow. So yeah. with the thymolin, uh, would that be effective if let's say you are about, you're feeling, oh, I'm getting sick and you had some stored on hand and you took it would it work like that? Or is this something you would just want to it, take it, well, it would, but I mean, again, and this is why peptides are so amazing. There's better, right? So there's LL37 and there's VIP, vasointestinal peptide. And those are like, and remember I said thymus and alpha one, right? Yeah. So like, so let's, let's look at them as like healing. How, how do we do this? Like, uh, so we have longevity or life extension and then we have healing and then we have bioweapon protection. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> right? No, seriously. Like, so bioweapon protection is thymus and alpha one, which again is just uh, conveying full body immunity. Uh, LL37 is antimicrobial, antifungal, antipathogenic. Uh, so, I mean, like you inject uh, LL37, nothing's going to harm you. Unreal stuff. And then VIP is the one peptide that they use and still are using with like elderly uh, 
COVID patients because it enhances oxygenation to the blood supply, mm. which as you guys know, if you remember back in 2020, during the beginning of the SA, I'm sorry, SCAM demic, <laughs> see how I didn't say it? <laughs> <laughs> you guys can edit that if you have I to. Like, but, listen, the news, hey, it's all going mainstream now. The news is all yeah, coming out. Yeah. People are like, oh, I, I, right, like, I don't have to say You can just read that right. article that came out. They haven't it, found out they will. When they, when they just came out. They're like, oh, it looks like uh, this might have come out of a lab. And, uh, yeah. and I'm like, oh, my God. Or the Lancet, the Lancet said yesterday, the Lancet said yesterday that they now admit that natural immunity is best. Did yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Convenient, right? Yeah. yeah. This is a few unreal. billion dollars later. Dude, unreal <laughs> stuff. Yeah. No, but so, um, so L. 37 is profound. Like if you have any kind of infection, so like, like, um, you know, you guys have heard this, but when people get sick with whatever COVID is or was, um, you know, they were taking uh, ivermectin and yeah. they were taking uh Lev Leviquin and all these things. Like if you had LL 37, you wouldn't need any of those. You just inject yourself twice a day for three days and you'd be sick. You wouldn't be sick. I mean, that's how powerful it is. Uh, and then again, that's the most profound, uh, you know, antimicrobial, antipathogenic and antifungal peptide that we know, but VIP to get back to that VIP was the peptide that you would, and still do, you would inject if you were comorbid or you had advanced stage COVID because now you can't get oxygen. Mm. Okay. Mm. Cause remember at the very beginning when we didn't know what was going on, they were intubating people because yeah. they thought it was literally causing some sort of airway issue. But now we realize that it was oxygenation in the heme of, in, in the red blood cells. And that mm. was what it was starving, what COVID was causing it. So if you had VIP, you would just inject VIP and literally you can't get COVID because it literally increases the oxygenation in the blood so much. So um, sadly, again, because docs are, you know, for the most part, when it comes to peptides, clueless and not taught anything. And it's not their fault. They're not taught this in med school. It's the same way with hormone optimization, mm -hmm. right? They're not taught about hormones. Why would they want to know about hormones? There's no pills to prescribe. But um, like, that's what they give people now in very advanced, like uh, convalescent centers or homes where like they have, you know, elderly with money, they inject them with VIP. And VIP literally will keep them from going into like a, you know, a COVID intubation, you know, loop. Wow. Yeah, Wild. so it's, it's profound stuff, but- <laughs> Um, so life extension would be thymolin and epitalon twice a year in two cycles. And there's, you know, again, my book has all of these things laid out. And that's the cool part about my book is like, people can just literally read it, not have to, I mean, not have to read the whole book, but if they want to use a peptide, just scroll right to it. Like in the index, the con table of contents, what's the dosage, you know what mm -hmm, I mean? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they can skip to it obviously in the book and just read the summary or whatever. But, um, Thymolin and epitalon should be twice a year if you're 40 to 45 and up forever. That's going to definitely guarantee you live longer. Again, you know, assuming you're not a giant, you know, morbidly obese dumpster fire of a human being, it's going <laughs> to definitely, it's definitely going to extend your life again through telomerase expression. Um, VIP, LL37 and thymus and alpha, which I call TA1 would be your, you know, uh, keep myself immune and impervious. And then uh, we didn't talk about healing. I know you guys know about healing, but you know, BPC 157. That one ooh. always comes up. Yeah. BPC, comes BPC 157, TB 500. So BPC 157, again, is body protective compound. That is the improved angiogenesis, which again is to increase red blood cell formation to strengthen and rebuild the tissue. Uh, TB 500 is the, you know, massive inflammation suppressor. So together that, you know, they work wonders. We haven't talked about, and we should for just a second, is GHKCU, copper peptide. So again, another sham wow peptide. That peptide can be used for everything. Hair regrowth, that's the number one peptide for hair regrowth, okay? 3% grade of GHKCU simulates the copper antigens into the scalp and also, again, into the red blood cells and increases red blood cell formation. Uh, but GHKCU, too, uh, topically, like wound, if you have a strong enough GHKCU uh, for, uh, uh, form formulation and you, it, you, any of us took a knife and we just went like that. If you mm. put that on there in five days, it would be completely sealed. Mm. Wow. Literally. Wow, in five wild. Days. Now you're five talking about days. copper too. We found out that, uh, that affects the color of your hair oh, yeah. as well too. Yeah. So, so, so GHKCU, and I know this from my company, from our products, uh, in raw material form, uh, copper peptide at a 3% grade or higher is purple. It's a crystalline purple. Hmm. So when you put it on, like as a skin formulation, it's like a royal blue or a light blue. And then eventually, you know, for the first 15, 
10 to 15 minutes before it completely absorbs. Your skin is kind of like a blue glow oh, and then wow. the body just absorbs it. So, so what do you think is going to happen then? Because uh, there's a couple peptides now that are making mainstream mm -hmm. news. Uh, semaglutide is one and of them. Terzapatide. Yeah, and these are these yeah. are the, what they call GLP-1. GLP-1 agonists. Yeah, and, and they're making, but they're, they're becoming uh, patented. They're Massive. Being, yes. So do you think that's the direction then that they're going to go? Because I don't know if they, if they can't stop it. The genie's out of the bottle. Right, right. The genie's definitely out of the bottle. You probably, I mean- Somebody that you guys know who doesn't want me to mention his name on the show <laughs> told me about a month ago that he doesn't see peptides going away now. So let, let me take a step back. So 10 years ago, like all of us, like fringe, whatever we were in the peptide space, we're always like, you know, looking over our shoulders, sneaking around, you know, because like, you know, peptides, don't tell anybody about them, right? And now here we are, research chemical companies are blowing up, peptides are blowing up. Like you said, it's literally mainstream consciousness. There's two reasons for mainstream consciousness with peptides right now. And I literally just, it's funny you mentioned that because there was a huge article that was just in, uh, I think it was the New York Times about terzapatide. Yeah. It's the number one weight loss drug of all time. Yeah, yeah, they're running out of stock. Yeah, yeah, yeah they can't keep it in stock. So there's, there's, this is two reasons for mainstream consciousness. And, and, and the genie's out of the bottle on both. But number one, 70% of adults over the age of 40 in the West are obese by the BMI. Huge market. 70%. Huge market. And then number two, the people who have quote unquote been harmed by whatever you want to call what has happened to them in the last three years are looking for alternative forms of healing and therapy, right? So peptides represent that. Let's pause there for a second. So just to add to that, the, yep. the public trust in um, establishment, in, in the establishment medical community it's has toast. fallen to all time low. Toast. So if you look at the polls and people and you ask people, do you trust, uh, you know, do you trust the federal government medical, um, you know, advisors? Do you trust doctors? Do you trust pharmaceutical companies? This is all post pandemic. That's right. It has fallen to all time lows. So you're saying that, that now we don't trust them combined with uh, these, you know, GLP one agonists that are actually showing weight loss. And the fact that there's so many OB. So those two things combined now is what it may be protect this market? A hundred percent. I mean, literally, like I said, the person that I just talked to is a very high level person in this market. And he told me, he gave him away. It's a he. <laughs> Oops. It, yeah. Uh, that it's not, they're not going away. Um, but to what you guys just said, uh, the FDA, big pharma will attempt to patent as many of them as they can. But see, here's the problem to that, right? Well, with like terzapatide, like the compound pharmacies have already, you know, broke that chain because all you have to do is add B6 or, you know, some mineral or, you know, l l carnitine oh, wow. or whatever to the formulation. And now it's not a patent anymore. Right. And that's what's happening with terzapatide. And that's what not, not with semaglutide, but that's what's happening with terzapatide. Now I've used both. I want to give you guys my experience with both of them. I'm actually writing my next book is in process. It's going to be called 30 days to shreds. And it's literally, you guys, I'll send it to you guys. You guys are going to love it, but it's going to be like, how do I get the leanest, most fat loss, theoretically and physically possible in 30 days, regardless of my fitness level or my training level. And this is using all these different peptides and meds, right? So this is something that four years ago, I could not have written this book because these, these agents were not available. But if you use these agents in these clinically precise dosages, here's the research, here's the studies. And by the way, I have 10 guys that have been like my, my guinea pig trial. You, you can't even believe it. I got guys in their sixties. I mean, you can literally lose with terzapatide and, you know, and we didn't talk about tesofensine. We should talk about tesofensine, but all these other peptides, peptides that are out there now, um, more body fat in 30 days than at any point in time in human history, at least in this version of human history, right? Yeah. Pre-Atlantis. So it's like, you know, what's, what's coming is, you know, back to your original question is they can't control it. The genie is out of the bottle. They're just going to try to monetize it. So mm -hmm. how do we monetize it by, you know, patenting it? It's always patented, right? It's the lawyers, right? It's how, how come our, how can we get paid and how can we, well, they might have to change company? the law, the way they patent things then. You well, know? I mean, probably, and that's probably what will happen. And the other thing is like, and this is where I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, with the research chemical company thing is like the research chemical companies, which, you know, all along, and I know a lot of the owners and stuff in that business, like have always been the ones that are kind of like the most worried, the ones looking over their shoulder. Right. Because again, they're selling stuff that says not for human consumption. You know, you must, sure. you must you, you tell me if you buy this, you agree to buy this, you're, you're using it on your laboratory animal and all these other disclosures. Right. Which again, legally protects them. It legally indemnifies them. It also legally indemnifies me as the affiliate salesperson or, you know, anybody that promotes them. 
Um, but it's always been this kind of like, you know, kind of under the rub where the, you know, the medical side of things says, oh my God, those are guys brewing shit up in their basement. You know what I mean? Like, why would you use that? But as you guys know, as uh, big pharma slash FDA has cut back or cut down or cracked down on the peptide companies, the research chemical companies have moved to the forefront now. That's where everybody's getting them. Most doctors are sending their patients there, which mm -hmm. is nuts, but it's true, right? Because they know, again, there's very little harm. They're very, very well tolerated. And again, they have profound healing, fat loss, muscle building, immunity enhancing, all these different things. So it's kind of an interesting place where we find ourselves right now. But I, I absolutely agree with what you said. We are in a place now where big pharma has to figure out how they're going to profit off it because they're not going away. And with bioregulators now about to also come into the forefront in the next year to two years in the United States. I mean, that you guys, I'm not joking. They, they, they actually make peptides look like child's play. That's what crazy. They do. Yeah. Right. So we really are in the forefront of what I would call a golden age or a new earth in healing. I won't call it medicine anymore because you're right. I don't know what even medicine is anymore. I mean, nobody trusts their doctor. You know what I mean? But they do trust smart people like you guys, like me, like people that are out there talking about these things and are obviously living social proof of their use. Right. Yeah. So like, that's kind of why this is like so blown up in just mainstream consciousness. I'm, I'm serious. Like when I put this book out, I didn't really want to put this book out because I put a peptides course out two years ago and it's done really, really well. But you know, my inner circle team was like, no, dude, you got to put the book out because like people want to read a book about this stuff. And I'm like, but it's just old. I'm just bored of this. Like, you know, the people that know about peptides already know about peptides, but the book has completely blown up in the last two months. Are you like, seeing an increase in physicians kind of oh, coming it, into it, the space? It's insane. And I have so many, that's like all my, that's who buys the course now is docs. Yeah. They're like, we can't get this information anywhere. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's, it's just, it's really weird though, because like, if you, you know, you guys talk to seeds, you know, seeds was very instrumental in building the peptide society. And there were a couple other regulate regulating eight bodies in clinical space. And they all got blown up when COVID came, mm -hmm. they all just went out, you know, through attrition or because, you know, uh, you know, everything shifted as far as in medicine and stuff like that. But like all those places are gone now. Taylor made, which was the biggest compounder that was providing all of the peptides to them too, also got in trouble by the FDA, mm. which is another story not worthy of this podcast probably, but like it just, it all went away. It disappeared. I mean, I literally went to Seeds' peptide conference in 2018 in August and there was like 1600 doctors from the United States that were there. It was huge. Wow. Wow. My, my business partner and I were both there and two years later, the whole thing was disbanded. Right now, obviously COVID, you know, and the whole thing that happened in 2020, you know, what played a part and a role in it, but now here we are back. And I think what you said, Sal, is that's where we're at, right? Like the, the medical establishment is at an all time low. Mm -hmm. People are done. They're just like, where do we find alternative information? How can we not go to my PPO or my HMO doctor? Right? Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of where we are. And so I think the psychological aspect is how can I heal and how can I become proactive? Yeah. How can I take ownership of this? Now, I do want to say that I still very strongly view these as um, supplemental to lifestyle change, yes. diet, 100%, exercise, sleep. 100%. Um, and I, I've, I'm also reading articles that more people are interested in things like exercise and yes. diet yes. than ever before, probably as a result of the stuff that I we agree. just talked about. In fact, I just read an article that big box gyms uh, now are starting to shrink their, and I was going to bring this up on another podcast. They're shrinking their cardio areas and expanding their strength training areas. Wow. Because they're finding, you read an article I read that, that too. A whole yeah. article about that's it. That's awesome. And, yeah, because they're finding that that's the new, that's where people are going. And we all know that's really shifting. The benefits of strength training for the average person just outweigh. Well, I'm anything glad else. you brought that up. And I, I want to talk about that. And I'm very, very outspoken about this. And I say this in the very beginning of the book. And, you know, I have a, a really awesome, um, if you guys don't mind me giving out, there's a, a, a link. It's a free landing page. It's the 10 mistakes people most people make when they start therapeutic peptides. It's just, I mean, if you guys can edit it or whatever, sure. but it's just the peptidescourse.com forward slash 10 mistakes. I highly recommend anyone go there. That's number one. They're not magic bullets. Nothing is going to give you anything if you don't have your lifestyle dialed in. If you're not living insulin controlled, right? If you're not, you know, training with weights, doing cardiovascular, hopefully a combination. Uh, you know, you're you're getting uh, six to eight hours of deep sleep every night. I mean, all that stuff is always the most important thing. None of these things are going to do anything for anybody who's not first doing right. that. And it's important for the listening audience. And I know you guys have pretty advanced listening audience, but it's important for the listening audience to know that, like, look, if you're not taking care of yourself, 
peptides aren't going to do jack shit for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's literally that simple. I mean, sure, the healing peptides, you know, can help you heal faster, right? But you're not going to get like a growth hormone inducing peptide, you know, or a MOTC or, you know, even any of the um, life extending like Epitalon or Thymolin. And we didn't even talk about Pinealon, the one that it, that uh, increases the size of your uh, pineal gland Whoa, and reopens on. that. Really? Right? Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a bioregulator and that's like a game changer. Um, oh, that's, that's wild. Something. Yeah. I mean, I probably, we're going to have to do a whole other episode just on bioregulators. I like, can you know, in this <laughs> conversation, this will be yeah, one seriously. of at least two or three this. episodes that we're going to do. You know, for sure. I can't help but, you know, after hanging out with Dr. Seeds, now hanging out with you. And what I hear is like, I want to take all of these. So it, do you do this in your book, Jay? Do you lay out like, because you've mentioned already, oh, you should take hierarchy. this for two two oh, times yeah. out of the yeah. year. Like, yeah. like what is like, yeah, why not if all of them are so beneficial, I can't imagine taking all of them at once. It'd be very unrealistic to be injecting that much stuff all the time. Is there like what you would call like an ideal kind of, you First know? off, I got to give you a that one. That's the best question anybody's ever asked. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't destroy my microphone. <laughs> so that is critically important. So, Yes, you can combine. And by the way, like big influencers, this is what they asked me. Like Chris, Chris Gethin is a really good friend of mine, yeah, right? Yeah. And he's always, on the show. Yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. And he's always asking me, he's like, you know, Jay, I love your stuff, but why aren't you talking to me about stacking? And I'm like, Chris, because like stacking is something that you think about. The rest of them don't. But he was right. I, I, to give him credit, shout outs to you, man. If you listen to this, um, the thing is, is that we have to focus as the end user on like what is most important to us, right? So if we're hurt, are we going to be doing healing and fat loss at the same time? Absolutely not. We're going to be focused on healing. And then we're going to think about that after, right? So it's like, it comes down to the end user. Are there thing? Are there times where you can do, um, you know, a fat loss stack and a, and a healing stack together? Probably not. Can you do a healing stack and a life extension stack together? That makes yes. sense. Right. Can you do... Uh, a muscle gain with a healing stack at the same time. Absolutely. Right. Cause you need higher carbohydrates, more water, more mm. food, to, you know, rebuild and stuff like that. Soft tissue injuries and stuff. Yes. So there are definitely times where you can do like one stack for one specific thing combined with, you know, maybe an ancillary thing like healing and muscle gain or something like that. But for the most part, people should focus on, and again, it's an amazing question and yes, it is covered in the book, but people should focus on, one specific thing that is their primary directive at that moment, right? So for aging people though, twice a year for sure, pet, uh, Epitalon and, pe and Pinalon, uh, I mean, Thymolin for life extension, for okay. to extend the telomeres, right? So that's without question, you're going to do that twice a year. Um, if you're, you know, somebody, again, most people, not probably your listening audience, but most people in America have a weight problem or have a b obesity issue or insulin resistance. So, you know, they're going to probably be on fat loss peptides, um, you know, it's like half the year, you know what I'm saying? You know, to, to constantly be dealing with the battle of the bulge or whatever. So it really just comes down to like what your specific priority is yeah. focusing on that priority and then moving from one to the other. But there are times when you can do a combination. That of just both. sounds like you're working with the way the body adapts. Exactly. It, it would be like trying to gain maximum endurance and maximum strength at the same time. And you'd end up getting a little of you know, almost nothing because they kind of don't work together very well. So. Yeah. A hundred percent. I did. I, I know I mentioned it. I'll just real quick before we end like tesofencine is a, it's not technically a peptide. You know, it's like we're getting into that conversation where we're talking about small molecules, but they're classified in the peptide realm. Well, okay. tesofencine is a man. I don't know how to even pronounce. Uh, I mean, I'm on it right now. I mean, it's the most amazing oral uh, peptide that you could take, but it enhances brain derived nootropic factor. Oh, sure. Like mm. through the roof. So you're like, so fired up, focused in flow state. Like if you're writing or you guys are producing content, you guys want to be on that. It's amazing. Uh, it's a capsule one, one a day. You, mm -hmm. you can take, uh, is that similar to dihexa? Cause that's what I, I started. Oh, dude, taking. This is, pff, yeah. this blows dihexa. Really? Dude, well, cause I dude, love dihexa. There is nothing Same. in the nootropic. We didn't even talk about the nootropic peptides. So if you guys want, we can. Real <laughs> that's quick. a whole other episode. Yeah, right, yeah. The better question is let's when do you it. have to be back? Cause we might just have to do a, a <laughs> yeah, second. I mean, exactly. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I don't fly out until 7 a.m. tomorrow. All right, so, so we might have, we might have to break in just a minute and then we'll come back. Yeah, no, I'm happy to. But so Tesso is a five, I always, screw this up. It's 0. 0.50. So it's like 50 micrograms or 25 micrograms. I take 50. Some people it's so like stimulating that they can take only half that dose. So, uh, the smarter research chemical companies out there now are making half of those doses. But again, it's a BDNF stimulator. Um, 
it massively, you know, with increasing BDNF enhances well being. And then you guys, not kidding you, like the longer you take it, it becomes a metabolic uncoupler. Oh, mm. so it shreds you. Oh, too. wow. Uh, <laughs> so it's like unreal. Now, I've had people, I've never had a single person uh, who's taken it, like complain of it, but they there are people that are very sensitive to it. And they're like, dude, it's the most amazing thing I've ever taken in my life, but I literally can't sleep at night. Sure. Now, those yeah. were the people that were taking 50. And so now that the, a lot of the research chemical companies is, are, have half the dose, none of those people have yeah. problems. And I got a little bit of that way. from Dihexa and C-Max where I couldn't sleep. So how much do you yet. take of Dihexa? Cause uh, I, I've taken 80 milligrams of Dihexa and I literally don't even feel uh, it. It's gotta be, I think it's 30 milligrams if I'm not mistaken. I think 30 milligrams. See, I'm having the experience he's having with Dihexa. I've been telling you guys that since we've been taking it. I get you up. I don't feel oh, you don't feel anything. Well, so I, and I've talked about this before. And again, I don't want to waste this if we need to edit this into another episode, but like I compare all nootropic peptides to modafinil. Right. So it's like, so that's your gold standard. Exactly. Okay. Modafinil is the gold standard. And for me, I don't need, need a lot. I've written three books using modafinil at 50 milligrams. Right. Like I used to take a hundred milligrams and then, you know, you get the headaches and you don't hydrate enough and blah, blah, blah and whatever. But like when I use, when I'm really deep in writing, um, I would use modafinil and none of the nootropic peptides until this. And, and by the way, tesafensine is not considered a nootropic peptide. It's considered a fat loss agent, right? But because the BDNF is so high, everyone who uses it is like, man, oh my God. Wow, wow cool. Now, mm. I, I do want to just add this and then we're done. Um, I used it for eight months and this is in the clinical literature on it. It doesn't have any receptor attenuation and you can cold turkey it. Oh, wow. So like, I was like, this is so unbelievable. I'm going to go off of this and I'm going to like crave it. And I went off of a cold turkey and nothing. My wife has also gone off of a cold turkey and nothing. And again, I've talked to hundreds of people who have gone off of cold turkey and nothing. It is a revolutionary medication. Interesting. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Jay, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Man. Thanks guys. Yeah. I'm yeah. So yeah. Glad got a lot more questions. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I had you on the show. No, no, yeah. we're going to have to sure. run this back for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. For sure. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 